Hello, folks. It is Tuesday, August 24th at 1230 p.m. And uh, I am uh, Christopher Shulgin. I'm part of the team who create content here at MedCan. Today's webinar is prepare your child for in-person learning. Uh, Labor Day is coming up. Well, actually, so, so, so September 9 in Toronto is the start of uh, the school year, actually. And there is a lot of anxiety. Some people are excited. Some people are anxious about uh, the return to in-person schooling. And so parents are seeking guidance. That's what we're going to provide today. Um, I'm going to read the preamble, then I'm going to read the bios for our two experts, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Janice Wise and Dr. Jack Muscat, and uh, they'll go through a small presentation to provide some guidance and then answer questions. Folks, to answer or to ask your questions, use the chat function or the Q&A function. Either one is going to be uh, just fine. Experts in pediatric health recommend that schools stay open this year with far fewer restrictions than last year. Some parents are excited to see their children heading back to school. Others are downright concerned at the prospect. To provide guidance and answer questions from parents, we gathered two MedCan experts. And our experts who, uh, folks, you can come in, uh, you can activate your screens. Dr. Janice Wise is MedCan's Director of Child and Youth Program and of Continuing Medical Education. She's a family physician with 35 years of clinical experience. She is a medical school graduate from the University of Toronto and a certificate of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Dr. Wise is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and a family medicine preceptor for both undergraduate medical students and family medicine residents. She is also a consultant to the National Ballet of Canada. Hello, Dr. Wise. Hello. Dr. Jack Muscat is a psychologist, executive coach, speaker, author, and the clinical director of mental health at MedCan. His clinical practice focuses on issues relating to stress, anxiety, and depression, as well as interpersonal relationships for patients of all ages. His organizational skills offer a deep understanding of how workplace stressors affect personal health and well-being. He provides clients with insights to better function both at home and at work. And Dr. Muscat received his PhD in applied psychology from the U University of Toronto and is a registered psychologist with the College of Psychologists of Ontario. How are you, Dr. Muscat? Feeling good. Thank you, Chris. Nice to be here today. Looking forward to our webinar. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information to convey, um, and then I'll come back for questions uh, at the end. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. I'm really happy to be here with my respected colleague, Dr. Muscat, to discuss our views on navigating the transition to in-person learning. There's no question we've all experienced a really turbulent year and a half. Um, but there's also no question that in our minds, kids should return to the classroom. Emotions and opinions may be swirling in your minds and we're gonna to attempt to make some sense of them and to provide some perspective. So the issue really boils down to what are the real physical risks of being at school versus what are the mental health and so social fallout risks from virtual learning? Um, according to Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table, which I encourage everyone to take a look at, in-person learning, I'm quoting, in-person learning is essential for the learning and overall well-being of children and youth. Therefore, barring catastrophic circumstances, schools should remain open for in-person learning. This is a document that was compiled by um, multiple experts, including physicians, educators, public health experts, etc., and it guides um, educators and public health um, to uh, how to approach in-school learning depending on the risk levels, whether they're low, moderate, or severe. But for the moment, I'm going to discuss with you the risks of physical harm to a child by returning to the classroom. Children over 12 or children born in 2009 and earlier um, have the opportunity to be vaccinated and their risks of getting severe or disease or disease itself is quite mitigated. So I think for discussion purposes, we'll focus on the children under age 12 who currently are not eligible for vaccination um, in the context of having a highly contagious variant um, of COVID-19. So you may be asking yourself, okay, what are my concerns? We've been ramped up 
to feel um, anxious about anyone catching COVID-19, but what are the real physical risks to our children? We know that the majority, vast majority of children will be either asymptomatic or will have mild cold or flu-like illnesses as opposed to older uh, adults. The concerns aside from mild disease, which we can manage well, are what are the serious complications that could happen from this infection? So the first question might be, okay, will my child be sick enough that he or she requires hospitalization? Currently, that is a less than 1% of all kids that get COVID. Unlike in the US, we are not seeing a massive increase in hospitalizations in children, possibly due to our higher vaccination rate here. You may have also heard of another condition called MISC, which stands for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This is a delayed reaction to having COVID-19 and the stats show it's less than 0.03%. Yes, it can uh, affect, cause very severe disease. It can cause ICU admissions and in a very tiny percentage of cases death, but we're talking a fraction of 0.03%. So yes, it's a risk, but it's extremely tiny. Then you might ask, okay, well, what about long COVID? That's where people talk about the um, persistent, vague, nondescript symptoms of um, this illness that can go on for many months, like brain fog or fatigue or headache um, that are real symptoms, but what is the risk of children getting that? And right now we still believe it's quite rare but very little is known of this entity at this point, uh, keeping in mind that these type of long haul symptoms can occur with other viruses as well. Um, but at the current knowledge base, we really don't know a lot about it and it does seem extremely rare. Um, and I think the last point that I think is a valid concern is if my young child gets this condition, catches COVID, could they spread it to vulnerable groups? Do we live with immunocompromised adults? Do we live with grandparents? Is there extended family living with us that they might um, expose the virus to whose immunity may not be quite as robust as a younger person's? So all of these are extremely valid concerns, um, but I think we need to take it in context with respect to what the other um, um, complications of not being in school would be. So, as parents, our protective instincts are always kicked into high gear when there's a threat. There's a sense of not having control over your child's experience at school. But there are so many other dangers that we've mitigated over the years. Um, and it's important to learn how to tolerate the risk, but to tolerate it with vigilance and not with panic. So I'm gonna actually hand it over now to Dr. Muscat, who can speak further on what we can do, including immunization, to control things in our lives and why that's important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, and for explaining the physical risks and what we're facing going forward um, in getting back to school. I just want to tell everyone on the call, parents and otherwise, that not only have we had to deal with the uncertainty of COVID and with vaccinations, we've also had to become um, amateur statisticians to try to figure out what's going on in the news. And I feel that it's created so much unnecessary stress as we're told to overestimate risk and to overfocus on things that are very, very remote. The most important thing that we really need to be focusing on and why we're all so stressed is that one of the coping strategies that we all use in dealing with stress is prediction and control. If you can predict what's gonna happen, then you try to come up with strategies to control it. Unfortunately, it's been very difficult to predict the course of this pandemic, but we do know that children, for the most part, 99% of the kids are okay. And as Dr. Weiss explained, that the symptoms of contracting COVID uh, is, are, are actually far less than what we're facing if kids don't go back to school. What we've seen throughout the pandemic is, as many of us know, an increase in anxiety, depression, eating disorders. Kids have been socially isolated and it's different at different age groups. 
ironically, the little ones, the preschoolers are probably going to be the most adaptable because as they get back into socialization, they will naturally rebound. The middle school kids are struggling with what does it mean for me academically? What does it mean for my friends? And the high schoolers are equally concerned around their studies and also their friends. And one of the things that we can do as parents is we can spend time listening to our kids and trying to understand how they're feeling, which isn't too different from how we're feeling as adults as we're thinking about going back to work and what a hybrid workplace is gonna look like. I think that one of the things that we can do that is really important as we're facing school in the next couple of weeks is recognizing that kids pick up their anxiety from their parents. And if we can convey a strong, confident approach to things and actually tell our kids, you know, if you, and I'm hoping we all had a good summer with our kids, either if they were at camp or at the cottage, that, you know, we go swimming, but we don't worry about drowning. We protect ourselves. We go biking, but we wear a helmet. We do other sports that we protect ourselves for. We cannot create 100% safety, nor should we, because life has risk. But what we want to do is go in with knowledge and with confidence and with teaching our kids that this is really a teachable moment for them to see that you know we are functioning well, that most of our friends are okay, that if we have immunocompromised individuals in our family, that we're gonna be safe around them, that we're gonna wear masks as needed, and that we're gonna be responsible about what we're doing. And I think kids will, will pick up that, that optimism that I think is really, really important to show them, plus the fact they have to go back to school because that's their workplace. I've always said that school is a workplace for kids, and they're needing that as much as parents are needing to see their kids in school. So I think that that one of the things that we want to do is be able to filter out the news, which in many cases is not so much misrepresenting, but overstating what risks are and looking at things in a rational way. Uh, the other thing that we can do, depending on your child's age or whether they already have a predisposition, and unfortunately up to 20% of kids may have already pre-existing mental health conditions that the pandemic made worse and that they need a little more encouragement in coming back is what I call nudging and, and, and creating situations where it's not unlike going to kindergarten. You take them to the school ahead of time. You uh, on maybe on a Sunday, you show them where their classroom's going to be. You, you um, create a buddy system where there may be an older uh, uh, family member or a friend that they can uh, connect with. You can do things around prepare a preparation for school in terms of new school equipment, in terms of uh, foods or sandwiches that they like to have, and really creating an optimistic approach to that. The other thing that I think is, is really important uh, is to create a sense, what I, you know, whether we call them play dates, but have a sense that there's something that can anchor the child to something at school that is more social. The other thing that we have to be aware of is that many kids, not unlike ourselves that are concerned about when we go to work, are we going to remember the passwords to our computer, is that kids are just worried about can I remember what I learned last year online? What's, what's my teacher going to be like? Do I know what, the, what help I'm going to have? And if we can tell them that we're going to be there for them, that we can help them with their homework, that we can help them get, get set up, that will help them also feel less anxious. So I think that, you know, in a sense, and I'll, I'll put it back to Dr. Weiss in a minute, is find out everyone's kid is different, even if you have a number of children in your family, what works for them. For the introverts, they may be concerned about, now do I have to socialize? For the extroverts, they may be concerned about um, who, where are my friends going to be? So I think that by listening to your child, not, not overreacting and, and having a sense that this is a new opportunity as we are uh, getting more vaccinations, that the rates are going down and that people are feeling better, that we can look forward to uh, a good school year and be flexible in, in what's, what's gonna happen and be positive about it. I love that you said this is a great opportunity to create a learning experience for a child. Life is full of ups and downs and unpredictability. And although kids thrive on predictability, they are not fully emotionally regulated. 
and they require the emotional grounding of their parents to help guide them through this uh, turmoil. So I think the I think it's also important if parents have anxiety to recognize it and to try to maintain some sense of um, control over their anxiety, however, whatever form that takes, whether that means um, information um, gathering, whether it uh, means uh, help, talking to people. I think it's really important as well to establish routines at home to provide predictability in the home environment so that your children have grounding within the physical home space. Um, and talk to your kids, explain to them what they can control on their own, whether they can, whether that means masking, hand washing, physical distancing, um, and listening to what their particular needs are. Some kids, it's so interesting in, in my journey over the last year and a half talking to lots of kids, some actually thrived on the virtual learning uh, scene. Some of them felt um, safer, uh, kids that perhaps didn't fit in perfectly well, um, kids that had been bullied, they felt very safe on a virtual platform. Um, I also have to give kudos to some fantastic teachers who are innovative and creative and um, created a really, really good learning space for kids, both in public and, and um, public schools, public and private school systems. Um, so it wasn't all bad for all kids, right. but I think that uh, the vast majority did suffer in terms yeah. of Dr. Muscat mentioned with anxiety, depression, and eating disorders in particular. I'd like to pick up on that point you made as well about the kids doing well we found even with adults it was a big reset and 20 percent of us have actually i won't say done well during covid but it was a kind of reset we had a chance to reevaluate what we're doing in our lives we had a chance to do new hobbies learn a language study and i think some of the kids if they were fortunate with good online learning and and we'd all know where that takes place were able to accelerate their learning do other things socialize you know, for those of us that don't recognize that gaming isn't just about playing games, it's the way in which young, you know, even pre-adolescents meet friends. And so they may be on their devices, but they're socializing the way we used to go to the mall. And, and that's their way of, of, of meeting friends. So for many of them, it was a great opportunity to connect with, with people. For those of us that, that didn't have an opportunity to participate in family events that were good events doing it through zoom allowed us to maybe meet families that were scattered around the world but we could be together there clearly has been losses we shouldn't forget for those of the older kids the high schoolers the university students who didn't go to prom who didn't get their first year you know in class that was a real loss and they're feeling some grief around that too and we have to be sensitive to that and say here's how you can make it up or here's the way some schools actually are kind of creating um, uh, a post first year get together or a post prom get together where where kids can celebrate those milestone events that are important to them. And if you can do that with your children, if that's something that they feel they want or something they feel they've missed, um, peer relationships become so important throughout their lives, but particularly during adolescence. And I like to tell parents not to worry so much about how they're doing because those years are behind them. The peers are much more influential uh, during the teenage years and it's important that we support them in doing that. The other thing that I would suggest is, is kids, you know, uh, I'm concerned a lot about Generation Z. I must say, Dr. Weiss, that there has been so much pressure put on them to do the right thing, to get into the right school, to get the right mark, to not fail, to not make a mistake, that when they reach a point where they have to make decisions, they're sometimes just gridlocked because they don't, they don't want to be judged. And I think this is a chance for them and for all of us to, to look at our kids and look at ourselves and say, we're not going to get it right. We're probably going to see more changes around public health in the next few weeks as we get more information where we need, we need to mask or not mask, where the vaccinated and unvaccinated should be. And rather than expect that everything should be perfect, we could say, look, even the scientists are changing. We want to follow the science, but we want to apply it. And science is about data and about reality and checking out what we're seeing against empirically validated 
uh, concerns and not just ideology where we feel we're going to be on one side or on the other. So it's a great opportunity to teach your children to really see how science operates, how vaccines are brought to market and how they can be changed and how we can get variations and, and it may be a booster shot. And, and it's, so it becomes less about risk and more about learning. And I think with that mindset um, ourselves, because we're, as, as Dr. Weiss said, we're protective of our kids. We, we worry for them, but we don't want them to feel our worry, our worry. We want them to feel that they have solutions ahead of them. So I think I'll stop there. And if you have any other comments, you'd like to add, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, no, I agree with everything you said. Um, I look at this journey as a ship in a storm and we are focused on being in the moment and getting through the current waves that are crashing, but there's no one that's telling us it's gonna be a straight course, there's gonna be zigzags, there's gonna be upsets, but you know, we have to stay in the moment. Um, utilize the scientific evidence as we have it today understanding that that might change next week or next month. Um, but trust in the science and um, listen to respected sources of information. Yeah, one thing that I think that, you know, I'm doing in my own life, and I think we're all doing, is I'm setting goals. We're, we're, we're hoping to travel in the next few months. And I was just looking online for travel arrangements and hotels. And I thought, this is going to get me out of my reluctance to travel by making a commitment. We have a family event in a few months. We're hoping to be able to be there. I think if kids can see, you know, when you're playing hockey, you, you pass the puck, not where the player is, but where he or she's going to be. In the same way, we have to anticipate where do we want to be in six months or a year? How do we then work backwards from that and set up habits and routines that will help us get there so that we're not scared, as you said, the ship in the moment, not looking at just what's in front of you, but looking at the horizon and creating um, a goal that you can then work towards and feel confident about. That was, uh, that was really great context. And uh, it's, it's great to get the two of you together because, you know, there's the, the physical and the mental side of things, which I think is, uh, you know, th this was great um, to, to hear both sides. So to, to sum up and feel free to jump in if you feel like I'm getting it wrong, but Dr. Wise, your take essentially is that um, the benefits outweigh the risks for children, uh, that in-person schooling is something that is um, uh, valuable and that you, know, you believe that the right thing to do is send children to school um, uh, in general, given you know, individual considerations and things like that, but, but that in general, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, right. I'm oh, sorry, I was interrupting. I say I've got two extremely strong convictions. One is kids must go back to school, and two is kids should be vaccinated. And well, that's tease up. That tees up, um, uh, Dr. Muscat. I want to get back. I want to get to you in the reentry anxiety in a minute. But that actually is a really nice segue, Dr. Wise, to um, the first first question, which is about when we expect uh, vaccinations for under 12s to be available. Is it, do you have any visibility yeah. in that? Like when- I've heard the, the medical chatter on that right now is the, um, the results, the data should be available sometime in early to mid fall with the implementation, hopefully with Pfizer at least by the end of 2021 for kids ages five and up. Um, but again, it'll all be dependent on the data that becomes available at end of September or sometime in October. Okay, so that so we're talking this school year though. This is yeah. not this is not something that is you know way in the future. This is something that is actually pretty imminent. Assuming that the data shows efficacy and safety. Okay, I mean I, I think that will help a lot of people. Um, yeah. Okay, so. so Go ahead, Dr. Can I just jump, jump in? I mean, this again, and it's not a, um, a criticism of what you're saying, Chris, but it's what we're all focusing on. We're focusing on an, a point, a single point, vaccinations. Do you know how many kids go to school where there's lice, where there's food poisoning, 
where there's allergies, where there's other colds that we're getting, I mean, where there's risk everywhere. The reason we're not freaking out about it is that we're not afraid of dying. Most parents know that if their kid catches a cold, they're going to be okay, or, or the, what we used to call the flu. If we start looking at these very remote outliers, and I'm not suggesting that kids should or should be vaccinated, but we shouldn't be worrying that if your under 12s aren't vaccinated, that they shouldn't go to school because not going to school has 100% risk of hurting your child's mental health, cognitive well being, social well being. There is no doubt. So, do you want 100% risk of something happening that you're not going to do versus? a 0.001% chance that something can happen. And, and I, I have to be a little tough about it because, you know, as we look at the summer and I, my heart goes out to, to, to families and people, we have, we've had boating accidents, we've had drownings, we have car accidents all the time. We put our seatbelts on and I look at vaccines as like wearing seatbelts. They're not gonna prevent an accident happening, but they're sure gonna prevent injury. And if you're wearing a seatbelt, you're, you're gonna be fine. And that's how I look at vaccines as not something that, that are going to prevent that rare occurrence of, of an accident, but that will certainly prevent injury. Certainly for those that are unvaccinated, I would urge them clearly to get vaccinated as we see that 99% of the cases that are happening now are with among the unvaccinated who are older, not children, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So this is where it gets very technical, but it gets off our topic, which is really getting the kids to school and feeling good about what they're doing, which in turn will build up a psychological immunity, which is more important than in some cases, I'm not saying the physical immunity, they can shake off the COVID much easier than they can shake off a mental health problem. And that's the bigger risk. Uh, I want to, um, I want to hear both your takes on this on this next question, which is be, because, um, uh, well, Dr. Wise, you mentioned the what did you say the medical scuttlebutt? Did you say uh, which is uh, a funny term, I think. But what is and then, um, Dr. Muscat, you're on uh, the medical advisory services team here at Medkin, which really has visibility in terms of like uh, you know farther off and projections and things like that. Here is my question. In the newspaper today, there was a bit of a kerfuffle about somebody resigning from the Ontario Science Advisory Table because um, the person felt that um, they were delaying the release of dire projections for the fall for the fourth wave, which raises the prospect of you know, increasing numbers um, similar to what's perhaps happening in the States. Do you think, like if you were to bet, because I think a lot of a lot of parents are, they want to send their kids back to school, but they don't want this kind of start stop thing where they're sending their kid back to school and then it's virtual again, and then it's back to, to uh, back to school. Do you think schools will stay open? This is, um, maybe this is an unfair question because I'm asking you to predict the future a little bit, but do, but what are your thoughts on whether schools will stay open through a fourth wave? Hey depends on the virulence and the seriousness of the variant of concern. So if you get a variant that is, escapes the vaccination, then that would be concerning. If we see huge uh, trajectory upwards of community infection, hospital admission, ICU admission, that would be a concern. So I think you have to look at local transmission, variants of concern, um, it's a multifactorial decision. I think that for the, what we're seeing so far, prediction-wise, yes, schools will stay open, but that's what the science advisory table speaks to. Low level, moderate level, and severe risk of infection um, and risk to children. Because generally schools reflect what community transmission is all about. Right. Um, when, when the community transmission and rates are low, the general um, infectivity rates within the school will remain low. And that's why we're really strongly encouraging everybody, schools, parents, friends, caregivers, um, get your vaccination. That is the best protection for society, for your children, for the vulnerable. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on, on, on Dr. Weiss's point. The schools are no more risky than the community. So if you're taking your kids to Wonderland or to a patio uh, and and we have a new variant, you're going to stop doing that. And you're going to be simply uh, 
doing what is right based on whatever the science is telling us. But you know, back to what you were asking, Chris, I still come back to if kids are getting rapid testing at schools for COVID and they don't have the symptoms, so long as kids can be symptom free, the risk is actually them transmitting to adults who are unvaccinated in the school. So that's a whole other conversation. But it's, I think, to what Dr. Weiss is saying, get vaccinated, we'll deal with it as, as it occurs. And sometimes the policy may not always follow what we know in the science, but we have to be overly, not overly cautious, but we have to, there's a public health mandate, which may be different than what's good for your kid. So you'll have to make an individual decision. But generally speaking, I think, as Dr. Weiss says, the schools are very keen to reflect the best practices that we should be doing going forward with whatever variant uh, occurs until another booster is available. So, you know, I, I don't think it's something we should worry about, but it's something we should be aware about. And as far as people resigning, um, that's news, but we don't always know what's behind the news. So we should just not pay too much yeah. attention to it. No, for we're, sure. We're fortunate in Canada that um, our health concerns are not as politicized as they are in the US. Um, so this might be one of those rare examples of potentially some political interference with public health policy. But again, we don't know all the details, as you said. Let's talk, so we didn't summarize, so probably we'll take, we're a little over time, but let's take another five minutes just to um, summarize, uh, Dr. Muscat, your uh, take on re-entry anxiety, which was essentially, I think, that uh, approach things gradually and set up situations where it's possible to do kind of a dry run of a situation without the elements that cause anxiety. And so what that is, is maybe um, before the first day of school, you're taking your child to school uh, and, and you know rehearsing the route again. Maybe you're making the, um, the lunches in advance. You're arranging social uh, play dates with school friends to renew those social ties. Um, one question uh, that, that came from the audience is about the way um, about routine and how, you know, it's, it's been a long summer. How do you restart those routines that position a child well for school life, such as maybe, you know, going to bed at a, at a, at an hour that is conducive to waking up at, you know, 645 or how, whenever the, the child has to get up. The question is, how do you restart those routines? Is this, oh, is that to me? That's the question. Okay, That's oh, the sure. Question. Okay. Um, I mean, it's no different than what you've done every other year in restarting routines. I mean, you can, you know, we all do that when we think about going back to work. So we'd get to bed a little earlier. We would uh, uh, start with, with what we're preparing for the next day. Maybe even um, start looking at um, some of the work that you're going to be doing, just preparing in your own mind, what, what you feel your child is looking at. It depends on, of course, it depends on every child, the age, et cetera. What I, what I was gonna say though, was maybe counterintuitive, is I also think because there's so much, we talked about cognitive fog and confusion, I would almost give the kids a break. I'm finding it's taking me twice as long to get things done when I'm wearing a mask because I don't have as much peripheral vision. I'm finding that I wanna do four things in a day and I can only get two done that there's a fatigue factor as well, and that we shouldn't overload or set expectations too high. One of the, the, the reasons people quit habits and routines is they just set goals too high in the beginning. So if, if, if kids are worried about having too many credits, maybe they should start with fewer and then add to them. Or if they wanna uh, stay up a little later, they should do that too. Um, but with an idea of kind of gearing down. An analogy I use is, is, is going to the pool. You know, you, I see this when we go to hotels and, and the, the water may not be at a, at, a, at a warm temperature. Those swimming in the lake, nobody wants to go in first. And then it's very cold. And after three kids jump in, everybody wants to get in. So there's a kind of, you know, monkey see, monkey do factor. We, we don't want to do it. And then we see everybody doing it and it's okay. We then want to do that. So that's how I think the nudge works. You don't want to throw people in the water for sure, but you want to allow them to choose how they can nudge themselves gently in. And often it's, they may not trust us, the adults, but they'll trust their friends. And so if they have a friend who's much less anxious, 
that friend could be a good role model for them in getting them forward, uh, moving forward, or even helping them with, with homework. I agree. And I think that it's very child dependent in terms of how you prepare them with a routine. Younger children, I'd get onto a, the time, school time zone, I call it, going to bed at an appropriate time, waking up at an appropriate time, um, eating at the times that they might do, uh, they might eat when they're back at school. Um, and listen to each child's individual needs. Every child is different. Some can't wait to get back and you really don't have to extend your anxieties over uh, with the child who has no concerns. Um, but you just listen carefully to what your child's concerns are, if there are any, be physically and emotionally available to listen to them, um, offer support, guidance, and um, really just being a good listener. Older children exhibit their anxieties in different ways than younger children. So be aware of what, um, how you, if your child is exhibiting any concerns. The older children might be um, spending more time in their room, not coming out when they, when they start going back to school or they may get angry or, or aggressive or um, younger children might be clingy or whiny or, or may have sleep disturbances or may wanna sleep with their parents, but they may not be able to verbalize what they're concerned about. So that's where a good parenting listening skills come in really handy. Um, right, and you can tell when your child is more than just feeling irritable. If they're, if they're chronically angry and irritable and angry or prone to outbursts, then you know, they, they need counseling, they need some therapy, they need some help. And it's not that you're doing anything wrong as a parent per se, it's that they're maybe not comfortable talking to you. So talking to a professional whom they can feel confident, will listen to them, and they can work out their problems. Their kids are very resourceful. They want to do well. They're kind of, you know, their default program is to do well. And when they're not, when it kind of tips for them, uh, we're sometimes part of the problem and not part of the solution. And having a third party help in a very uh, uh, compassionate and, and, and comforting way can give that child or that adolescent uh, an opportunity to move forward. And if, if the symptoms are too severe, as we're seeing in cases, then they need uh, a greater intervention and a greater assessment and treatment. And that, that can be available in the community as well as that med can. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I mean, I keep in my own interaction, we, um, my wife and I have three kids. And in our own interactions, I keep coming back to one thing that you said, Dr. Wise, in your uh, video that you did for the MedCan YouTube feed, which was, about hearing children's concerns and just listening. And that this, uh, you know, your, your point I think was to sum up that you're, this is an unusual time. And the thing that kids are looking for from their parents as they're entering in, they're transitioning to this new school year is, is just being heard and listening to their concerns and, and just kind of being there for the children. Um, uh, so I think about that a lot. Uh, yeah. Kids have to relearn how to interact with the world. And some, for some kids, it's very straightforward and some kids it's a little rockier. Um, as I said, listen, listen, listen. Um, I've been accused as a parent of trying to fix problems instead of just listening. I've been told, mom, can't you just listen? Can't I just tell you what's wrong? You're always trying to fix it. I'm going, yep, that's my job. I am trying to fix things. And I've learned from my kids that it's, just as important to be a good listener and not necessarily try to fix their problems, but ground them, try to guide them uh, if they want that guidance. The other thing I would quickly add, you know, we're, we're to your point, uh, Dr. Weiss, in terms of us being seen as, you know, not so much that we're knowing it all or that we have all the solutions, but that we should also show our vulnerability in a way, in a very specific way, where we can say, you know what, we're worried about going back to work. And if you've got a, a younger child, they can help you get your stuff together. How do I put my stuff in my computer bag? Help me make my lunch for, for work. And so it almost becomes the, a parallel um, activity that you're doing, that you're showing your younger uh, child that it's okay and that they can help mommy or daddy in, in what they need to do in getting set up for work. There was a wonderful uh, story in the New York Times where they asked eight-year-olds, 
what they thought because they were home with their parents all year to describe their parents' jobs. And uh, I'll refer you, you can just look it up, but uh, it was quite interesting. Daddy's on the computer, he's quiet for an hour and then he starts yelling at the screen. And uh, <laughs> mommy walks around a lot and bites her pencil. So, you know, they're, they're watching us. So I think we have an opportunity to really, uh, you know, as, 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 as Dr. White says, to listen and to be, to say to them, we're in it together. And I think that really gives them a feeling of, of support. I agree. That's, um, that's fantastic. And that's a good, uh, so I am gonna share my screen and move over to, uh, wrap this up. So other resources. So MedCan has um, a number of uh, resources that could help uh, parents um, uh, of children who are returning to school. So one is the Child and Youth Assessment Program that uh, Dr. Wise runs. Um, and then uh, another one is uh, Mental Health Counseling for Children, um, which uh, Dr. Muscat's team uh, handles to, uh, to, to, to arrange either appointment, uh, contact MedCan at 416-350-5900 or email client services at medcan.com. The next thing is, uh, oh, yep, uh, MedCan presents future webinars. So Tuesday, September 14, 12.30 p.m., the future of travel. So that's uh, the clinical director of the travel clinic at MedCan is going to talk about how to travel um, when, when and uh, how travel will change, uh, whether business travel returns, um, and if business travel does, uh, how to do that safely. So that's Dr. Aisha Khatib. That's Tuesday, September 14th at 12.30 p.m. And I am going to get over to show you how to do that. So to sign up for that, go to the MedCan Listen, Watch, and Learn page. How do we get there? So we go to the main medcan.com page, Go to podcasts and webinars, scroll down, and then the future of travel, and you just uh, register right there. So that is how to do that. This has been wonderful. Dr. Janice Wise, thank you for your time. Dr. Jack Muscat, thank you for your time. Any final concluding thoughts, or um, uh, shall we go about our days? I was just going to say this is going to be a bumpy transition back to the next normal, but I've got no doubt we're all going to get there. And if you need our help, we're here for you. Agreed. Dr. Muscat? Agreed. And, and be safe. And remember, look both ways before you cross the street. <laughs> Take Good care, advice. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now. Talk to you. Bye.